Let's all stand and sing our song of praise, friend of God. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. You are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call. Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? seated if you will. Well we want to welcome you here, glad you're present today and I trust our worship time together will be a good one. It will inspire us, encourage us, lift us up, uh, keep us focused on the Lord but we welcome each and every one present and those who are tuning in live we welcome you as well and glad you're uh, taking the time to be with us as well as we worship together in spirit and in truth and I think that that understanding probably takes on a little bit different meaning uh, now these days than any time that we probably thought of that scripture because it is about uh, it is about the spirit and the truth of God wherever we are whether we're at home or whether we're in this very building so we welcome everyone present so and we're glad that we have visitors with us and guests with us as well so thank you guys for uh, joining us and, uh, and being part with us uh, as well so we trust that our worship time will will uh, will uplift us and encourage us as we kind of themed our message more towards uh, how to, to face defeat and get over that. And so we hope to give you a little substance and meaning to that uh, in just a moment, okay? So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you grant to us the opportunity to, to worship together, to recognize uh, your presence, to recognize uh, your love, to recognize your grace. And Father, I pray that, that if anyone this day finds themselves a little bit defeated or even discouraged, that this will be a day that, that they, they turn the, they allow the, your light to shine into any dark corner of their life to brighten up uh, their minds and their hearts as it's uh, focused on you. First of all, we thank you for allowing us to worship together, but more importantly, we want to bless your name, lift you up amongst all others and all things in our life, uh, to lift you up as, as our Father and as our friend and our provider and caregiver. 
Thank you again for loving us, and thank you for being our friend. In your name that we pray, amen. Trust that uh, today, you know, when you when you hear music like that and and uh, and it stirs something within you, it reminds you that there is a reason why that stirring is there. And God's spirit is a spirit that takes a spirit of discouragement or a spirit of defeat, and and knows how to change that in our individual lives. And so I know from time to time, every one of us get down, and that's normal. That's just a normal part psychologically that we're going to face a down day maybe it's a little bit rainy or a little bit cloudy uh, and you're just not you're not enthusiastic that day and so you feel a little down we're not talking about just being down we, today we want to think about defeat and every one of us has defeat that comes in our life and if you really look back at the defeat and it pro may it may go back to one problem in all of our lives and this is not a statement of judgment on your life or on mine but the fact is sometimes the defeat is there because we have sinned in some way of our life that has affected us in our fellowship to God and therefore we've taken our eyes off God put more of our eyes on ourself and when we do that we find ourselves defeated as well as deflated and so, as we think about this message, I hope that we can find encouragement and find some guidance as to us rising from where we are of a defeat to rising to that which we move back into the area of victory. And so, in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 24, and then focusing on verse 24... And the, powers that, the power that is there in that one verse helps us to realize where victory rests. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through verse 24, it says, But Peter stood up with the eleven, 
raised his voice and proclaimed to them, Jewish men and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. And then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke, and the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus the Nazarene was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. And here's the power. God raised him up ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held in it. And so when you and I are facing defeat, you got to go back to this verse. If you and I are connected to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God lives within us, in other words, we've cried out to him and we've been given the gift of salvation, we are tagged with the label that is good that says we are saved. When you know that deep within yourself, then you have power within you that helps you rise above a defeated moment of your life or defeated season of your life because the victory is not in your hands, the victory is in his hands. And as the grave could not hold him, and if he has power over the grave, he has power over death, don't you think he has power over any defeated moment of your life and mine? They can help us rise from where we are to where we need to be. And so this message is rising from that defeat. The greatest encouragement in the Christian life is focusing on how God demonstrated victory when he shattered the pains of the grave. And he shattered the pains of the grave. And so if he can do that, he is more, more than ready and more than able and more than willing to help you rise from that defeatable moment of your life so that you have victory once again. And so what I want to do is, is, is talk with you a little bit about facing that defeat. I just discovered I found my glasses. <laughs> Yay, I can see now. All right, so we... We can rise above that defeat. And uh, it's, in, it's in John chapter 21 that I want to focus our attention for just a moment. Because I love this, I, I mean, I love this passage, or this whole chapter of John 21 because it's where Peter says to Christ prior to his uh, crucifixion and his trial, Peter says to him, he says, Lord, you know, I will, I will go to great lengths to serve you. And, and I will never deny you. I will be there when no one else is. I will stand tall when everyone else runs. He says, I will never deny you. And then Jesus says to Peter in that conversation, he says, before the cock crows three times, you will have denied me. And sure enough, we know the story. It came about when Christ was crucified, all the disciples were defeated. They were in a place to where they were, no, they were not just discouraged, they were defeated and scared. No longer was Christ physically on the earth with them. He was now crucified, he was dead, he was placed in a tomb, and it was sealed, and for the disciples, all they saw was death. They could not see the vision that he told them that in three days I will rise again. 
And in the midst of that, they began making accusations against all the disciples and pointing them out. And out of fear, they ran because they were fearful of their own lives. And they came to Peter, and on three occasions, Peter denied the Lord that he even was associated with him. The very one who once said, I will not deny you. Now, when it came about and people began to look at Peter, he couldn't hold his head up high. Peter was in a very defeated state of his life. He was so defeated that he probably could not see beyond his own shadow. He was so discouraged and defeated that he could not do anything else but go back to his former way of life. And in John 21, this is the recording of where Peter left the ministry of what he was doing and serving God because he's so defeated that this is what he says in John 21. And after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is all the Sea of Galilee, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and and the two sons of Zebedee, two other disciples. And this is what happens in verse 3. Peter says, I am going fishing. You say, well, that doesn't sound like he's a defeated man. It sounds like he's happy. Well, If you and I say we're going fishing, that's what we're doing. We're probably just going fishing to enjoy a moment on the water, the river, the ocean, wherever we're fishing. But that's not what this is. Remember in Luke chapter 6 was the calling of the disciples. And one of those disciples who was in the boat with the other disciples was Peter. Jesus walks up onto the shore of their life and says, guys, have y'all caught anything? And of course, they didn't know who he was. And they said, no. And it's a little comical in Luke chapter 6 in their response back. But then Jesus finally, in conversating back and forth with them, he finally says, why don't you throw the net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch all the fish because they had fished all night long. And when they threw the net on the right side of the boat, which was the opposite of that custom, they reeled in an enormous amount of fish, so much that it caused the boat to begin to sink. All right, we're back to the same occurrence three and a half years later. And it says here, he says, I'm going fishing. And the others with him, other disciples said, we are are coming with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Three and a half years later, it should have automatically been a record, a rewind of the tape. Oh my, we've done it again. We fished all night long and caught nothing. Three and a half years later, we fished all night long, we've caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, just like he did three and a half years ago. However, the disciples did not know it was Jesus. They did not know it was Jesus because they were so, so defeated. They were so much in their dark moment of life, they could not see beyond where they were. Men, Jesus called them. You don't have any fish, do you? <laughs> no, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. He told them and you will find some fish. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. And therefore the disciple, the one that Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer garment on around him, for he was stripped and he plunged into the sea. But since they were not far from land, land, about 100 yards away, football field. The other, I missed football. And the other disciples came to the boat, dragging the net full of fish. And when they got out on the land, they saw the, the charcoal fire with fish lying on it and bread. All right, let me talk with you about how you and I can face defeat. Still focusing on John 21 for just a few more minutes. And as you think about Peter, this is it. 
Here was a man that was defeated, but becomes a man that is now determined. Okay, we're talking about right now his defeated moment. But we're going to see him become a very determined man. All right, so here is that situation. Three and a half years later, it's almost a repeat of what happened when Jesus called them as disciples to follow him. And now he stands there in resurrected appearance form. And here it is all over again, and the words in Greek, I am going fishing, is this. Peter says to all his friends and disciples, I am going back to my former way of life. When you break down the construction in Greek of that sentence, it's a continuous action. It's not a past event. It's a continuous action and in Greek. So what that means is, Peter says, I am throwing everything that I have learned over the last three and a half years of my life, I'm putting it on the back burner, and I'm going back to that which I will not be defeated in any longer. I'm going back to my former way of life because I know I can make it work and I can supply for my family. I'm leaving the ministry. That's what he says. Fooey on it all. Because, not because of Christ, but because he was, so, he was so wrapped up into the dark cloud of defeat that he could not see beyond where he was and where he needed to be. And so all he could see was his immediate moment and he could no longer see, sense the power of God. He would no longer can see the vision of God. He could no longer picture himself doing the work of Christ. And so he says, I'm going back to that which I can control, that I can do on my own, and I don't need anybody to help me. Guess what, Peter? You went the first night out, and you fished all night long, and you caught nothing. And it wasn't until the power of God stood on the seashore of his life again that he says to him, throw the net on the right side of the boat, and when he did, he hauled in so much fish that they couldn't even put it all in the boat. And so Peter, after hearing what the other disciples said, it is the Lord, Peter did the prettiest swan dive into that water and he swam as fast as he could to the shore and Jesus already had fish prepared. Did you catch that? The fish is already prepared and he's got bread. Maybe a little peanut butter and jelly. I don't know. He's ready for Peter to swim back to him. He's ready for Peter to get out of his funk and get back into where he was called to be. He's ready for Peter to leave the cloud of darkness and move right back into the beautiful area of light. When defeat happens, it's because we allow the darkness of the world to take hold and snuff out the light of the work. And it's not because God did anything, it's because we have. And it might go back to one sin of our life. It may go back to multiple, or it just may go back because we are wanting control of our own life. And we're just not ready to give it up yet, or we're tired of giving it up, and we just keep pulling the strings to get back to some former way of life. But Peter was a man who was just defeated. Where we know the end of the story. So I'm not giving you a profound truth that you don't know the end of the story. The fact is he was a man of defeat, but he becomes a man who's very determined. In Acts chapter 2, in verses 14 through 17, we see where that determination begins to happen. Now, continuing in John 21... Therefore, the disciples, the one that Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, as we said, he tied that outer garment on, he dove into the water, and there he found Jesus on the shore. There in verse 9, where it says that, the, that he saw the charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish that you've just caught, Jesus said to them. So Simon, guide up. 
hauled the net ashore full of a large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus says, come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus, here he goes on to say, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told them. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. And I assure you, when you were young, you, were tie, you, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie it for you, carry you where you don't want to go. And he said this to signify the kind of death that he would glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Do you see what took place? His three denials, three questions. And it's interesting, again, you break down the Greek structure of all those words of love. Basically, Jesus gets Peter's attention one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, as a friend to a friend. Sounds like Moses, doesn't it? In Exodus chapter 33, verse 17, he comes into Peter's figurative tent, and he has a tent meeting with just Peter, and he's facing him face to face as a friend, and he says, I'm your friend, Peter. And he says, I want to ask you three questions. Number one, do you love me more than these? Well, what are these? Is he referring to these fish? These other disciples? Do you love me more than anything else in your life? Is what he's asking. Do any of these things of your life, do you love me more than the temporal? Do you love me more than this which will fade away? where moth and rust will destroy and thieves will break in and steal. Do you love me more than all these earthly things? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I like you. That's basically the Greek meaning of the word love that Peter says back to Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? You remember the greatest commandment I said to you a few years ago. You heard it. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. You don't love me with all your heart, and you don't love yourself because you're all facing your defeat. You're in your dark cloud. Do you love me with all of your being? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I like you. He uses the word philo, the philo love, the brotherly love. You know that I love you as a brother to a brother. And Jesus says, that's not what I asked you, Peter. Do you love me more than anything in your life? Do you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you, are you willing to love your neighbor and love yourself? Do you love me more than anything in your life? And Peter says, yes, I, I, I like you. I, I love you. I love you. Again, he's talking about affection, the affectionate love. He's not talking about the total commitment love. He's not talking about when he says back to Jesus. Then So Jesus changes the question. He says, all right, you're so caught up in yourself, Peter. I see that. And you, your head's sticking out the dark cloud, and I know you can see a little bit of light right now. So do you like me? Do you like me? Do you have that brotherly love to me? And at that point, Peter realized. Three denials. Three questions. Three aspects of love demonstrated in his denials and now three aspects of love presented to him in the form of a question. And at the point that he asked him the third time, Peter broke down and said, Lord, you know everything. I, agape, love you. 
I love you with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my being. Then Jesus said, okay, then feed my sheep. Get rid of the old life that you came back to and get back on the horse and ride again. You fell off, you got a bruise, it's sore, it hurts, it aches. Who cares? Get back on the horse and ride it again. You may fall again, you may get hurt again, but don't take your eyes off me. So where does defeat come from? In my life, personally, it comes when I take my eyes off Jesus. You would think that Peter would recognize that. It was the same Peter who walked on water. And when he looked at the water and everything around him, he began to sink. And you could hear him going, gloop, 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 gloop. And he reaches his hand out, and Christ grabs his hand and pulls him out of the water. You would think from just that experience, it would have said to Peter, yeah, I took my eyes off Christ and I sank. I took my eyes off Christ, that's why I'm, why I'm scared, and I'm going back to my former way of life. That's why I'm wallowing in my defeat. But he just didn't get it. Until he realized that the man who had the power over the grave has power over Peter's defeat. And so now Peter goes from a man who is defeated to now a man who is determined. Because back in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 17... And Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and he proclaimed to them. So we know that Peter rose from defeat because he stood back on the platform that Christ gave him. And to present the message and the claim of Christ as he was intended to do from the very beginning. And so now we see him and Peter says, Pay attention to my words. And he's referencing the Pentecost experience where the Holy Spirit came and power fell upon all the peoples of the land. And they began to hear the message that was in their own tongue, in their own language. And they were wondering, what is this gibber and jabber they're hearing? And he says, listen, these people aren't drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. We know it's not that. He said, it's the power of God. Listen to these words. And so we know that Peter becomes very determined all over again, going from the shelf of uselessness to the shelf of usefulness. As Christ comes to the seashore of his life, even in his defeat, and helps him to get his life back in order so that he could be used all over again. There's another scripture. Remember, we're, we're talking about how to face defeat. And we're looking at the scripture. And I trust that the scripture is speaking to you as it's speaking to me and giving you the answer. I'm not going to be an elementary school teacher here. I'm going to let be a professor. I want you to take your own notes. And I want that notes to sit into your heart. And I want God to communicate the truth. And let's look at another scripture. Here in John chapter 8 is a beautiful passage of Scripture. Once again, in chapter 8, verse 2 of, of Gospel of John, at dawn, he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him, coming to Jesus. He sat down and he began to teach them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman called in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of, of committing adultery. Still blows my mind. It takes two to make that happen. So where's the man? In the law of Moses, commands us to stone this woman. So what do you say? Trying to trick Jesus. They said this to trap him in order they might have evidence to accuse him. And Jesus stooped down and he started writing in the sand with his finger. I've doodled a lot in the sand. I'd love for that scripture to say, Jesus just tucked his head down and began to doodle in the sand. When they persisted in questioning him, they weren't going to let up. He stood up and he said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. 
And then he stooped down again and he continued doodling, he continued writing on the ground. And when they heard this, they left one by one, starting from the older men. Only he was left, Jesus, he was left with the woman in the center. And Jesus stood up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you. And then he gives the command, Go from now and sin no more. Here was a woman who was caught in, according to the, the Jewish law, was a lawbreaker, okay? We know it's the man's world during that time, so that's why the woman is brought to the center, not the man. And so she's brought to the center of everyone. And they began to, to question Jesus about this woman's greatest defeat. Not only is she embarrassed, not only is she ashamed, but she's now standing in the center of her defeat. And Jesus says to her, or says to the ones questioning about her, says, all right, I'll tell you what, go ahead, stone her, knock her down and kill her. If, you have no sin in your life. Makes a difference, doesn't it? He says to the woman, he says to the men standing there, all right, if you are without sin, then I grant you permission, kill her. And all of a sudden, they began to think of their own life, and one by one, all you heard was thunk, 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 as they let go of the stone and walked away. And then Jesus looked at her, and he recognized two things. He recognized that she stood alone in her defeat. She stood alone because of the choices that she had made in her life. But Jesus wasn't there to kick her where she needed to go lower in life. He was there to rise her up. And the second point is, he recognized the problem. The problem wasn't the law of Moses. The problem wasn't all those who were pointing fingers. The problem wasn't every external experience of her life. The problem was her and the choices that she made in life. And Jesus says, then go sin no more. So Jesus is willing to see her go from a guilty Individual, a woman who's guilty, who now is forgiven. A woman who's caught, a woman in the midst of her guiltiness is now forgiven. Isn't it a wonderful thing when you and I together realize that we are forgiven? That we stand before God and he's our x-ray machine. And everything about us is known by God and he knows everything from the inside out, and God still does not run from us. There's some things in your life and my life we might would go, oops, I didn't know that about you. You might face a little shock. But it's not that way with God. He wasn't shocked about the woman. Yes, he was heartbroken that she made those choices. Yes, he knew why she was facing defeat. He knew why she was so in, in a dark cloud of her life. But he also knew the power that would get her out of it. And the power was forgiveness. So Jesus is basically telling the woman, he says, Woman, I forgive you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in, in our power. I am going to remove your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I am going to clean you up as white as snow. It's all based on what you do next. Go sin no more. If you want to live in the light, you've got to feed yourself toward the light. And he's warning her to step out of that corridor of darkness and into the experience of light the light that will guide her, who he says, I am the light of the world. And he's, he's working on 
rising her up from her defeat. A guilty woman, now forgiven. Do you remember when you stood before God and you felt the weight of your guilt? And you said to God, God, save me. I need salvation. I need help. I need to be saved from the sin of my life. And all of a sudden, a transaction happened with the Spirit of God inside you that confirmed, and no one can take that away, that God breathed life back into you, and He began to give you a new nature, a new nature bathed in His Spirit. And He said to you then, You are my daughter, you are my son, you are forgiven. But I must give you this warning. As you stand before me with all your guilt, go and sin no more. Leave that life that you once led and you will understand where defeat needs to remain and where encouragement and joy and victory rest. Remember, here is the man. Here is Christ, the very one who had the power over the grave, over death, over hell, stands before this woman and says to her, I am giving you victory today. I'm giving you life. Forgiveness, freedom, joy. Now let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Here's Jesus, the man who had it all together. The man who had it all together in chapter 2, of Philippians verses 1 through 8. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, of any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, consider yourselves, consider others as more important than yourselves. And everyone should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Make your attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Jesus is the man who had it all together. And you see in verse 7, you see humility. You see one who emptied himself. This is what I find that happens when I'm in, in defeat. My pride got a little bit ahead of where it needed to be. And I may have been deflated <laughs> because someone was there or the things around me were there that knew how to put the pin into the bubble and deflate me pretty fast. Push. And I'm wallowing in my defeat, discouragement and deflating moment of my life. Because... I allowed pride to be more important than humility. The man who had it all together is all about humility. He emptied himself and became obedient as a servant. And when our obedience, I mean, when our humility is not there, our obedience is not going to follow. Again, it goes back, I think, many times, not always, but many times, the defeat that we live in goes back to the choice that you and I have made. Using the pattern of Peter and losing the example of the woman at the well. One who left Christ, left the ministry, one who had no idea what Christ was about until he stood there offering her forgiveness. And so you see also in verse 7, we see servanthood. We see where Christ takes on, emptying himself, assuming the form of a slave. Isn't it good to know that you and I give, we, we, we come to Christ to ask him to bail us out of jail, 
In other words, we've wrapped ourselves behind the bars that have imprisoned us in the sin of our life. We stand before Christ and he says, I've got the answer. Now that you've committed your life to me and you've asked me to come into who you are, I'm going to just turn the key now and I'm going to let the jail cell open so that you can go free from this point on. And we go free from the jail cell to become the slave unto Christ out of joy and out of enthusiasm because we want to serve him with all our being because we've come to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and we want to serve him the best that we can. So we see humility, we see servanthood and of course in verse 8, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Now, my mother and father taught me obedience, and my backside showed it sometimes of how it came about. In other words, they would tell me, son, this is what you got to do, and if you don't do that, then there are repercussions. So if I wasn't obedient, as my mom and dad told me, I had to face the consequences. Sometimes I was sent to my room as a timeout. Sometimes I deserved more than just a, a belt lashing, but that's how they raised me. And I knew that when I weren't, was not obedient that I paid the consequence. Well, to you and I, it's a little different when it comes to us as a child to the Father. God's not standing there with a belt to pop us, to get us back in line. He allows us to make those choices. And He wants us to, to waller in those choices a little bit so that we won't, won't waller in them again. So that we'll come back to him and say, Father, I am sorry. I learned from this. I want to be obedient from this point on. I don't want to go back to that ever again. I want to be your servant. I want to be obedient unto you from this day forward. Have you ever fell off a horse? Has anybody ever fell off a horse? It hurts, doesn't it? You know, if you land flat on your back, you could break something real quick. If you fall off sideways, you could break a shoulder. You can break an arm. You could, you could, it's more than just falling down and then looking around if anybody noticed. At that point, when you fall off the horse, you hope somebody noticed because you're going to need help getting up. Well, not only, yes, your pride is hurt, you're aching, you're paining, and you're a little bit fearful. But in order to rise above that, you got to get back on it again. You got to give it a try. You know, and there's God. He, he, he's, he's standing there this time like, you, like he's humped over and he becomes the step stool. So all you've got to do is just step up and throw your leg over the saddle and there you go. And he holds the reins this time. And when the horse bucks, he's there to catch you. It's different when you and I are obedient unto God. It's different when we take our eyes off of ourself and we put them back on God. It makes the world a difference for all of us. And that is the answer to rising from defeat. Putting our eyes on Him so that they stay there. But the question still remains, why are we so prone to defeat and discouragement when we know that God holds the remedy to our victory and success? Why are we so prone to defeat and discouragement when we know that God holds the remedy to our victory and success? Knowing it and living in it are two different things. I, I've lived in defeat. And I've, I've seen the face of my own defeat. I've seen the results of me taking my eyes off God. I've seen the results of others who've done the same. I understand that process. And why are we so prone to it? 
because we're so prone to taking our eyes off him and looking at our immediate and not seeing the eternal and the future. We get so caught up in where we are. All right, let me give you an example. When the coronavirus started, it was a virus across the seas. The moment it came to the United States, we no longer saw it somewhere else. We saw it in our life. And every report for the next 30 days was centered around the immediate. I can see the future. You got to look beyond it. The virus is not going to control our life forever. As it came, it will go. It may take years and it may take a lot of adjustment, but it will go. And you've got to see what's immediate, but see what's beyond that. And the same thing happens in our life. The immediate is very important, but the eternal is more. What we're going through is very important, but who God is, is more. And you and I have to look beyond our immediate and see what's there out there more for us. God is not a God who says, Aha, glad you're defeated. He's not a God thinking, Okay, maybe this time you learned your lesson. That's not what it's about. He's a God who doesn't want us to go in defeat because He wants us to keep our eyes on Him. He doesn't want us to have to wallow in our guilt. He doesn't want us to have to go back to our former way of life. He doesn't want any of that. He wants us to be obedient and remain fresh in His presence and live in His grace. And it's very operative and very powerful. He wants us to have victory. He doesn't want us to be the people prone to defeat and discouragement. He wants us to see that He is the answer and He holds the key to our greatest freedom and success. God is not one who says, I want to do away with you. He's a God who says, I want to use you. If that wasn't the case, it never came back to the seashore of, of, John, of uh, Peter's life. That's there in John chapter 21. Because he would have gave up on him and said, okay, you made your choices. Fooey on you. I'll go to somebody else. But he doesn't do that. He comes to the shore of his life. And he says, Peter, get out of, the, get out of the, your, your darkness, man. Step back into the light. That, the, that, that you have committed to is still within you. The power that you've known and the power that you've experienced is still there. You've just lost vision of it. So the key is walk in Jesus' steps and you will discover a brighter life and a light for your journey. If you walk in Jesus' steps, you will discover a brighter life and the light for your journey. The joy of what I've shared with you, just those two examples of Peter and the woman at the, at caught in adultery, is that Peter stepped back into the light and the woman stepped into the light. Big difference. But it's the same result. The realization is, I stand before God completely forgiven and completely powerless to receive His power and His forgiveness so that I can have great success and victory for my life. So do you want to get out of your defeat and step into victory and step into the great success of your life based on God's success? Then walk in His light. I am the light of the world, He says. And light penetrates darkness so today is a day in which you and I are called to turn to him to see his face and to get a vision for the future that he has for our life you know it's Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says I know your future I have plans for you plans not to destroy you but plans to give you a hope and plans to give you a future God is a very futuristic God. He sees beyond our immediate into what we can become. Are you willing to step into that becoming? 
and catch a hold of what Jesus has for your life. So how does it happen? Very simple. If you've never committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no greater time than right now to say, Lord Jesus, I commit my life to you. I'm ready to step out of my darkness and I want to step into this spiritual light. I want to be saved. Lord, save me because I am a sinner. That's all it takes. I promise you, God's not going to say, okay, i got something to do. I'll be back with you tomorrow. I've got someone else on the line. I'll have to put you on hold. No, it's going to grab the attention of all of heaven when one sinner repents and turns to God. That's the call for your life. It's very simple. Save me, Lord, for whom I am. Give me life and give me that salvation. For those who are tuning in live, if you, if you know a need in your life, our number is right there on the screen, over to the right-hand side, the bottom right-hand side, and it says it's 843-828-3333. That, that number is a number you can call and reach us, and we'll help you. The call for us sitting here today, in a moment, we're going we're gonna to sing a song to, to reaffirm our faith. Not necessarily an invitational call here at the altar, but an invitation call unto you and God. It says, I give you my heart. Or if you're at a point where you're defeated and, and, and you realize, you know, it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. You got you to put that on the chalkboard of your life and write it. I know I just dated myself chalkboard. We don't have chalkboards anymore. Uh, but anyway, you put it on the computer screen of your life. It is not God's fault. It's not his fault that you are defeated. So whose fault is it? It may not necessarily be all of your fault. It may be the circumstances of your life that has happened that you've got caught up in those circumstances, but it still goes back to you and to me. Step out of it. Reach out to God and say, God, I need your hand. I'm drowning here. I'm no longer walking above the water. I'm in the water, and it's up to my neck, and I need you. Reach your hand out, and he will, he will grab it, and he will help you, and you will stand dry, fresh, and in the light once again. Use for him and use for his service. Let me pray with you. Father, we, we thank you that you're a God who who understands everything about us, that understands our defeat, understands the place we're at, understands even right where we're wallowing in and whatever mess we've made of our life. You understand the choices we make. You understand the sin of our life. You understand who we are. You've created us. You've had your eye on us from the very beginning. You know everything about us, even the hairs on our head are numbered by you. You know us inside and out, and all that knowledge that you have, you still love us, you still call for us, you still seek us out, you're still shining your light in our darkness. Thank you, God, and help us to have the courage to reach up to you and say, I need you. Father, thank you for that victory, and thank you for the help and the call that you give each of us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Jesus, I know what I am. And now that I know that, I've needed you, so help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Try me, Lord. Maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself on my way back to you. Lord, help me, Jesus, I've wasted it, so help me, Jesus, I know what I souls in your hand. Lord, help me, Jesus. I've wasted it, so help me, Jesus. My soul's in your hands. But now that I know that I needed you, so help me, my soul's in your hands. Now that I know that I needed you, so help me, Jesus. My soul's in your hands.